Hi there, welcome back to the MathScale series on Jetpack Data Store. In this fifth episode, we will be covering two additional concepts, data store to data store migrations and testing. Hopefully this will provide you with all the information you need to add data store to your app successfully. Let's jump into Android Studio straight away to take a look at these concepts in code. We previously talked about migrating from share preferences to data store using the share preferences migration. However, it is likely that at some point you will also need to do a data store to data store migration. For example, when you make some significant changes to your data set, like renaming your data model values or changing their type. This process is very similar to the migration from share preferences. In fact, share preferences migration is just an implementation of the data migration interface. To understand how to properly use data migration, let's break this down. Data migration is the interface for migrations to data store. Methods on this migration, should migrate, migrate, and cleanup, may be called multiple times if data store encounters issues when writing the newly migrated data to disk, or if any of the migrations throws an exception. Should migrate specifies whether this migration needs to be performed. If this returns false, no migration or cleanup will occur. This will be called every time the data store is initialized. Migrate performs the migration. If it fails, data store will not commit any data to disk, cleanup will not be called, and the exception will be propagated back to the data store call that triggered the migration. Future calls to data store will result in data migrations being attempted again. Note that migrate will always be called before a call to cleanup. Cleanup is the place where you would implement any logic to remove the data from the old storage. This will not be called if the migration fails. If cleanup throws an exception, the exception will be propagated back to the data store call that triggered the migration, and future calls to data store will result in data migrations being attempted again. We will work off the working with preferences data store code lab. In order to create an implementation that would suit our migration needs, Let's imagine a scenario where we'd want to migrate from old preferences data store to new preferences data store. We want to remap and rename one specific old float key value pair to a new int one. Migrate all other key value pairs from old to new as they are. Clean up old storage. For simplicity, we will do all this in our activity using the preferences data store delegates. But you can follow the instructions from our previous episode on health injection to move this into an injection module. We implement data migration and override its functions in the following manner. Old preferences data store is our old data store we want to migrate from. New preferences data store is the new storage which we want to migrate our data to. Therefore, in produce migrations, we implement the data migration interface and override cleanup to remove the data from the old storage, migrate, which provides an instruction on how exactly the old data is to be transformed into the new data, and should migrate, representing the condition for whether the migration should happen. You can specify any condition here that meets your data migration requirements. For example, initiate the migration only if the old data storage contains values and hasn't been cleared yet. Produce migrations will ensure that the migrations are run before any potential data access to the new data store. This means your migration must have succeeded before data store emits any further values and before it begins making any new changes to the data. As the produce migrations parameter takes in a list of data migrations, you could transfer from as many old storages as you'd like. That is all it takes to migrate your data safely. You can easily follow the same pattern to migrate proto to proto data store. The only difference would be in how you transform the data. Every good story needs good testing. To wrap up our series, we will go over how to approach testing your data store. Again, we'll be referring to the working with preferences data store code lab as a starting point. However, keep in mind you can use this material for setting up proto data store testing as it would be very similar. To test data store fully, we'll need to do a bit of setup for instrumentation testing. This would enable us to verify the real updates are being made to our storage, according to our expectations, as we'd be writing and reading from an actual file. 
It is also possible to just mock your data store instance and inject it as a dependency to another class when unit testing, but you wouldn't be able to run any real verification checks on the data store itself. In our code, the class that is responsible for reading and writing data to our data store is the user preferences repository. So we'd want to verify that this class, along with its functions that interact with data store, are working as expected. We create a user preferences repository test class. Now that we have the scaffolding for our test, let's start with creating our test subject, user preferences repository, and work our way backwards. To get an instance of user preferences repository, we need to pass an instance of data store. We'll build a quick test data store instance that would create a separate test file, which we can further use for setting and verifying dummy data. We use the preferences data store factory to create a preferences data store instance, and we pass task coroutine scope, which our test operations will be performed in, produce file that constructs a test file we will use for reading and writing data using the test context. Since data store is based on Kotlin coroutines, we need to make sure our test has the right coroutine setup in place. To do that, we need to add the test coroutine dispatcher. This is a coroutine dispatcher that performs execution of coroutines, which is by default immediate. That means any tasks scheduled to be run without the delay are immediately executed. Test coroutine scope is a scope which provides detailed control over the execution of coroutines for tests. The job addition allows us to easily cancel the coroutine as part of a regular cleanup after each test. After setting up all that, our test class should now look like this. Our first test will be just verifying the state of our data when the test data store is created. We'll get the snapshot of the data without subscribing to the flow and do a quick check against our expected result. In our user preferences repository, fetch initial preferences is the first function we'd like to test. When the repository is first created, it checks if the data store is empty and sets a default instance of our data in that case. If we think about the necessary steps for this test case, we would need to create a test data store with default values stored, which we've done. Create the test subject user preferences repository, also done. Set the expected user preferences representing what we're expecting to find in the test data store. We haven't done this yet. Call the repository fetch initial preferences, also not done yet. Verify the return values match our expected result, not done. Following these steps, our test should look like this. You might also notice Android Studio complaining there about how suspend function fetch initial preferences should be called only from a coroutine or another suspend function. And indeed, our fetch initial preferences is a suspend function. But since we're calling it from a test, we need to make sure we avoid any real-time delays. Kotlin coroutine tests saves the day yet again with a simple solution for testing. Surround it with test coroutine scope run blocking test. One down, one to go. Our next test case verifies if our repository is making the right changes to data store by enabling or disabling the store sort order value. We follow a similar pattern. Create a test data store with default values stored, which we've done. Create the test subject user preferences repository, also done. Call the repository enable sort by deadline with a new value which we haven't done yet. Verify the test data store values coming from repository's user preferences flow. Match our expected result. Not done yet. Therefore, in our test, we would then add a call to enable sort by deadline to our repository with the new value and then verify that it has been successfully written to data store. That covers our basic test cases. You can follow the same steps to increase your test coverage for this repository class and test its other functions. Now all that's left to do is a bit of maintenance and cleanup for a healthy testing environment. And that's it. Now we've covered how to test preferences data store. You can follow the same pattern and try it out on Proto Data Store as well. In this math skill series on Jetpack Data Store, we have covered a lot of different topics but all of which are crucial for understanding data store and using it correctly in a production environment.
We've looked at how Data Store works, what benefits it brings over shared preferences, and how to add it to your app. We also discussed which serialization approach you can use, how to inject it with Hilt, and finally, how to test it. Now it's up to you to try it out.